way. What he meant was that the various Pentagon accounting systems that existed, there were hundreds of them, could not reconcile, uh, could not balance the checkbook, and that this was an amount that was unreconciled. It wasn't, uh, lots of duplication was involved in that money. Now, having said that, that does not mean that everything was hunky-dory and everything was you know, honest. Obviously, there was a lot of dishonest, and there was a lot of money that was siphoned out of the system. We don't know how much, but the point is there's been a lot of theft going on within the federal government. One of my favorite people talks about this, of course, is the great Catherine Austin Fitz, maybe one of the best public experts on the matter. She's had a lot to say. So there's that. There's the, you know, likely knowledge of an ongoing alien presence and large scale operation. I will also come back to that a little bit later, but we have to assume this is a global phenomenon that our guys know about. It, clearly, they know about it. We've got satellites everywhere. We've got a, a space force out there now. We've got NRO satellites, Navy satellites, Air Force satellites. They blanket the globe. You can't tell us that they're oblivious to this. Obviously, they know a lot of this. And it's a difficult matter for them to want to get into. Knowledge of location of alien bases. Clearly. They have a pretty darn good idea. Heck, I'm developing a, a couple of ideas just based on the latest book that I'm working on, my study of USOs. Uh, I'm sure they have a much better idea. Uh, now, now it gets a little crazier, but must be said. Do they have knowledge of infiltration? I am not saying that I know that there has been such a thing. What I am saying is that a responsible conversation and analysis must include this as a question. Is this going on? And I will add further, over my many years of looking into this, I have from time to time come across indications that make me think this could be the case. There's certainly a logic to it. It's not illogical to think that an alien group that comes here would want to infiltrate. Why wouldn't they? They're looking at humanity uh, radically, massively expanding its power. Every week, we're just becoming more and more powerful as a species, more dangerous to ourselves, but definitely very powerful. Uh, yeah, they certainly might want to get their influence into our society. Maybe for better, maybe not for better. We don't know. Is this something we want to know about? You bet we do. And this could very well be an issue. You know, there have been a number of books and studies over time that have made allegations of some kind of human alien collaboration. Uh, just about a, less than a year ago, I did a reread of Dan Sherman's Above Black. Very interesting book. That's just one example. There's a lot of these uh, claims out there. So is that a possibility? Um, now we're getting into some more heady scientific issues, and I'm not going to be able to follow up on this, but one of the red lines just might be, what is the actual nature of reality? This phenomenon is a mind-blowing, paradigm-shattering thing. And uh, it deals with space. It deals with time. It deals with consciousness. It deals with a radically, potentially different way to understand the very reality within which we live. And is that a difficulty? Is that a red line? And it just goes on and on and on. You know, there are a lot of very difficult subjects here. It's not, in other words, simply matters. My very good friend, Steve Bassett, said yesterday, so disclosure is just the president going up on a podium and saying it's real. Well, yeah, but no, it's more than that because there is an inevitability of an avalanche of questions that would follow a genuine disclosure. Once we're allowed to ask the questions, they're going to come out and they are going to be difficult, difficult ones for us to resolve. So um, let me talk a little bit about the UAP Disclosure Act. This is uh, a very important element going on right now that is promising or threatening, depending on your position, uh, perspective, to bring us very close to the reality, to those little bombshells that I've just mentioned. This act is part of the National Defense Authorization Act. The UAP disclosure is about 60 some odd pages that's been put into the thousand plus page NDAA. And that is the annual defense funding bill, essentially. 
So the, or you can call it the Schumer Amendment, because it was, it was sponsored by uh, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, uh, which aims to facilitate a public disclosure of records relating to UAP or UFOs. Um, it is expected to pass. I don't think there's any question that that will not pass uh, and be approved by the president. I mean, the NDAA is always passed. No one ever, um, you know, is going to like fight against it. So it does mandate the release of information about UAP to the public. Let me get into a couple of the details and then we'll talk about some of the limitations of it as well. Um, I actually, I finally read it. It's long, it's legalistic. It's important to understand. So it mandates the creation of a UAP records collection at the National Archives. That's in College Park, Maryland. Uh, it uh, emphasizes the presumption of immediate disclosure of all UAP records. So throughout the federal government, it, um, it presumes disclosure of UAP records unless there's a good reason not to. Uh, mandatory review of UAP records by all government offices. So they are mandated or they will be mandated to conduct a review within their offices for UAP records. Um, it creates the establishment of a UAP records review board. So a group of individuals who will be charged with reviewing the data coming from the various government offices. Um, and here's, now this is a key part, the public disclosure or postponement of those records, either if they are to be postponed, if there is a reason, it must be based on clear parameters, clear evidence. Now, that's a big loophole, but that's not the end of it. There is to be an ongoing review for those postponed records, and that's here number six, the creation of a controlled disclosure campaign plan. That's the words of the of the of the bill for those postponed records. In other words, those postponed records, they're not out of the woods. They're going to be up for review on a regular basis, according to this amendment. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're going to be approved, but it means that they're not, they don't just get a permanent pass as far as the language of this uh, amendment goes. A periodic review of the postponed or redacted UAP records. It's kind of similar to what I said before. Uh, protection for witnesses and whistleblowers is embedded into that document. Very important, of course. And oops, finally, uh, supposedly the termination of the review board after they complete their work, how that is determined, I'm not quite sure. But those are the, the basics. Then there's a little bit more. And uh, let's just get into this because this is quite significant. Dealing with private entities. Okay, so um, this is, the, the wording here, you know, I've tried to understand this. It's not 100% clear to me that this is absolutely mandated. UAP records from private entities should not be withheld or redacted. Private corporations with federal contracts, think Lockheed, think Boeing, think, you know, those guys are encouraged <laughs> to disclose their UAP records. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to. Chances are they won't. But what we do have is that the review board can subpoena their private entities for relevant information. Someone is raising their hand. I'm not answering questions at this time. Sorry. Uh, if I have time at the end, I'll do it. So they these private entities can be subpoenaed. So there's some teeth here. And, you know, depending on the political will behind it, this can be a powerful amendment to the NDAA, that is for sure. Now, there are obstacles to this act. Let me just talk about a couple of them here, and they're obvious ones. So you have one loophole, uh, as I kind of discussed, that could allow the UAP data essentially to remain concealed indefinitely. Yes, it would be subject to periodic review. This is my understanding of it. Uh, maybe future events will modify or correct uh, how I'm seeing it, but this is how I'm looking at it. Um, so you have the potential for this data to remain concealed for, as far as I can see, forever. Uh, just a, you know, ongoing exemption uh, every single year. It's possible. It's kind of a hassle to do that, but it's certainly possible. Um, uh, just as significant is that this act requires a lot of cooperation between different elements of the United States government, which may not be the easiest thing to do. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucratic intransigence. Everyone knows about this. Uh, and it's 
not a sure thing that the information is going to come out. I mean, the U.S. government is like a, a labyrinth within labyrinths within labyrinths. And actually getting to the information itself may not be difficult, especially if there is motivation on the other side to conceal what it has, uh, which gets us to this part, likely resistance from the secrecy group. You have to assume these people are circling the wagons. They are doing everything possible. I'm going to get into the reasons um, in just a moment as to why this is very likely the case. But there's going to be resistance and obfuscation, aside from just the normal bureaucratic uh, stuff that you, the red tape and all that. Uh, the other thing is that the act, as far as I could tell, does not specify clearly the format of the data that is to be released, which at least in theory makes me think the, the form of data that they do release could be very difficult for us to understand, could be quite opaque as it were, and not necessarily easily seen. Now, in all likelihood, any data that is released will be looked at very carefully by many researchers. So perhaps that objection is not as uh, strong uh, as some of the others. Uh, but here's a possible obstacle 